So, everybody turn to your neighbor and ask him this question. Amen. Who's in the center? Say what? Who's in the center? Turn to your neighbor and ask the question, who's in the center? Who's in the center? Who's in the center? Who's in the center? What's the right answer? Jesus. Amen. There was a, I was listening to a, to a uh, sermon on the radio the other day, and uh, there was a young man who had gone, was raised in a church, and then he decided to join the ministry team and got involved and started, you know, they started doing the ministry work, and he uh, saw that the pastor was kind of getting stressed out a lot more and more, and just kind of getting worn down, and one day he walked up to him and gave him a piece of paper, and he said, Pastor, I need you to draw a circle. And the pastor drew a circle, and then he said, I need you to draw a smaller circle in the middle. And he goes, uh, they had just started this new, this new area of ministry, and he goes, Pastor, what's the most important part of your you know, ministry you've been involved in? And you know, the pastor said, well, you know, it's the men, and it's this and that. The guy he was nervous and he goes, Well, Pastor, you're wrong. He goes, It's Jesus. Amen. Good. Amen. Without Amen. Jesus, nothing, you're not going to be able to do anything and nothing matters. Right. And the pastor was humbled and dumbfounded, and right there they prayed together. So, all the people who's in the center. Right. Amen. Um, so, tonight, this kind of piggybacks a little bit off of what Steve was talking about last week. The title is The Immature Christian. And uh, I believe we fall under this all the time. Sometimes we're a little more mature, sometimes we're not. Um, but I, you know, the Holy Spirit, I was praying and this kept coming, coming to my mind, so this is what I wanted to present to you guys tonight uh, the definition of immature is uh, not fully developed, having or showing emotional or intellectual development appropriate to someone younger. And the what I came up with as an immature Christian definition, and there's a lot out there, but I just summed it up as an immature person who continues to think and act with a worldly mindset and never moves past the stage of a new or infant believer. They constantly have to be fed the baby bottle. Mm -hmm. If you can't remember how a young child acts, let me remind you. They are selfish, impatient, impatient, moody, and don't like to listen to authority. This is why it's vital for parents to give their children a solid, godly foundation. Children have to be taught about discipline, structure sharing, respecting authority, how to treat others, etc. If a child is not taught these principles, they end up struggling throughout life because they're in constant rebellion, or as Tony mentioned, defiance. Most people understand teaching children is a process and it takes time. We understand that children are still going to act immature at times because they haven't fully developed mentally. This doesn't excuse them from being penalized for their bad behavior, though. If a child misbehaves, we as parents punish them accordingly so they learn the difference between right and wrong. Yes, it's true that some adults never mature. Uh, Steve, Andrew, it's a joke, guys. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a compliment. <laughs> it's an affirmation. <laughs> I, I resemble the, I resemble those remarks. Uh, but for the most part, once a person becomes an adult, they usually have put childish things behind them. Like I just mentioned, some adults never mature and suffer the consequences for their behavior. Many of our prisons are filled with immature adults who made unwise decisions. Many marriages have failed because one or both spouses have acted immature toward each other. Many adults have cost themselves opportunities in life due to immature behavior. I could go on and on, but I believe you get my point. A mature adult understands there is a certain way they should conduct themselves at all times, regardless of the situation. 
The same logic can be applied to the spiritual side of things. When we become new believers and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are considered infants in Christ, meaning we have not fully developed into mature Christians. Just like children, it takes time for a new believer to mature and learn how to conduct themselves in a godly manner. Also, just because a person has accepted Jesus into their heart, it doesn't exclude them from being held accountable for bad behavior. If anything, it makes them more accountable for their actions in life from that point on. The body of Christ is set up in a way so new and or immature believers can be taught by mature believers the ways of God. <clears throat> Otherwise, no one would ever be able to fulfill his or her mission to help expand God's kingdom. The real question is how and why does a person who seems to be a mature Christian end up acting like a person who has never heard the word of God? I've been guilty of that many times, guys. Yep. Amen. It's not easy to always pinpoint a single reason. But there are definitely indicators when it comes to the behavior of immature Christians. So there are six signs I want to share with you guys. One is self-centered. Two is they constantly complain. Three, they do not believe the Holy Spirit speaks to all believers. Four, they consider they do not consider reading the Bible or fellowship with other believers is important. Five, they are easily offended and unable to control their tongue. And six, they follow men instead of God. So we'll start with number one, self-centered. <coughs> Many people are interested in what they can get versus what they can give. This doesn't mean that a person should not invest in themselves. It means a person must find the balance to serve themselves and others. We need to live a life that tries to please God and not ourselves. Everyone has a problem with selfishness in some area in their life. There's nothing wrong with asking God for things. If what I want is not what God wants, then we need to immediately let go of our plan and take hold of His even if it means to sacrifice something or to step out of your comfort zone. In the end, a momentary time of sacrifice will lead to greater joy. <clears throat> Jesus died so we don't have to live for ourselves. He, did, he died so we could live for him. The greatest thing God has set a person free from is themselves. In Philippians 2, 1 through 4, Scripture states, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Self-centered people are deceived. A person can be religious, but not a representative of God. God is not interested in our sacrifice with serving in the church and following all the rules. He is interested in knowing where a person's heart is. Can you give up the idol in your life that makes your flesh feel good, or can you let it go and follow God? The things of this world lead to death and no fulfillment. The things of God lead to more, to a more abundant and fulfilled life. A person has one life to live and one life to give. The choice is simple. You're either going to live for yourself or live for God. Point number two, an immature Christian constantly complains. Complaining weakens a person's spiritual wall of protection. Praise, gratitude, thanksgiving make us stronger and release more help from the Holy Spirit. A person will never complain their way into increase. I will say that again. A person will never complain their way into increase. We are to prophetically confess increase over every good thing in our lives. We all have angels assigned to us and they hearken to God's word. We can either release or hinder their help in our lives, according to the words we confess out loud. 
Whatever is not of faith according to the Bible is sin. If a person is going to complain about something, they should not be surprised if that prayer is not answered in the future. A person cannot have it both ways. They either have faith in God or they don't. We must not quench, stop, suppress, or subdue the Holy Spirit. God will bring in person revelation on his time at the right time for every situation. Scripture in Numbers 21, 4 through 9 states, They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. <laughs> Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is one of the oldest tricks in the books. The enemy is always trying to get our eyes off of, off of Christ and to keep them on ourselves. A person cannot be pitiful and powerful at the same time. There are some very solid reasons to complain, and I understand this, but this is not what I'm referring to here. This type of complaining is the constant grumbling over how God operates within the body of Christ and or in uh, different areas in a person's uh, life. If we truly believe God is in control of everything, would we really complain about as much as we do? I think not. Does the world need another complainer or doer? Is your daily attitude a reflection of Christ or a reflection of the world? You know, guys, when we complain, that's just a... Another door we open for the enemy. As you can see here, when they were when Moses was leading them out of Egypt. And so it was, you know, we know what the snakes represent the enemy. So immediately when the people were complaining and grumbling, the enemy came, that's what happens when we're together or you know you're fellowshipping at a church. Once somebody starts that fire of complaining, it just goes in like snakes and it just destroys everything that has been built up. Just like that. Ministry that has been built for years is destroyed immediately like that. So we've got to be very, very careful of the words we say, we, the words we say, guys, because it's either life or death. Uh, point number three: um, an immature Christian does not believe the Holy Spirit speaks to all believers. If anyone has read their Bible, they know that the Holy Spirit has spoken to believers since the creation of mankind. Just because a person may not have had the same experience as another believer does not negate the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4 to 14, Scripture states, My message and my this is Paul talking, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, with no eye has seen what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things of God prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the th deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God, 
so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Freely means freely to everyone. The Spirit is free to everyone. This is what we uh, this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are only discerned through the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a big one here because a lot of people say, you know, they criticize someone when they say the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It's not our right and it's not our place because we are not God. We do not know what God is trying to speak to some a man or woman. We, we have no right to judge that because we do not know. God's ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. Always remember that. And so, the last thing I put here is the last time I checked, we are not God. <laughs> None of us are, and according to the picture here, <laughs> Andrew's Capways is still up there. Which one? Oh yeah, today I will oh, let God, God be God because I suck at it. <laughs> okay. So let's let's remember that. None of us are good at being God. Point number four. John, men, I apologize. Yeah. I'm getting pressure from my mom. Okay. So I gotta go. Go for it. I was hoping I could keep her off till 8 30, 9 o'clock, but she's, she's like, Curtis. come Thanks now. Hey, nice, nice to meet you, Curtis. Curtis. Nice, nice, nice to meet you. If I don't see you again on this side, I'll see you on the other side. Hey, Amen. Right. And, uh, and, uh, Bye, Curtis. Yeah. See you, brother. Thank Thank you. God bless Thank you. you. See you, <laughs> Okay, so uh, point number four. Immature Christians. Um, consider reading the Bible in fellowship with other believers as not important. I know we've all heard people say, I don't need to read my Bible to understand the gospel, or I don't need to fellowship or praise God with other believers. These two statements have always confused me for these reasons. Many times, those who don't read their Bible have the most questions about the fundamental teachings of the Bible. Many times, guys. They have questions about salvation, Forgiveness, grace, sowing and reaping, and etc. It's mind-boggling to me. If you don't read your Bible, you're not going to understand. This is this this is not just paper and words. This is a living thing. What is, what does our word say? In the beginning was the word. Was the word in the beginning? The word was God, and the word was with God. <clears throat> This is not just words on paper. This is actually a living organism. Amen. But yes. People don't understand that. This thing is life. Life. And those who refuse to fellowship with other believers are the ones who seem to constantly fall back into sinful behavior because they're alone and isolated. I know that none of us are perfect. And we will never be until we are reunited with Christ. Amen. But until that day comes, unless a believer puts on the full armor of God that Paul refers to in Ephesians 6 and consistently surrounds themselves with mature Christians, they will be easy prey for the devil. There's a good reason why God said it's not good for man to be alone. In 2 Timothy 3, 14-16, Scripture states, but as for you, continue in the things that you have learned and of which you are convinced, holding tightly to the truths, knowing from whom you learned from them and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings, Hebrew scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, surrendering, surrendering your entire self to him and having absolute confidence in his wisdom, power, and goodness. All scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. You cannot do God's work without reading the Bible. Okay? You can do your own work. 
everybody's going to bed. <coughs> in Ecclesiastes 4, 7 and 12, it states again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of, an, of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. What a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And guys, this is why we do life together. This is why we meet every Thursday. This is why you fellowship at the church you go to. <coughs> because when you fall, you will have a brother or sister. And if you are one of those people who says, I don't need to go to church, I can do things on my own. Well, don't be surprised when you fall and you get into, you know, that battlefield of the mind and you have no one to turn to. There's no one to blame but yourself for that because there are brothers here, out there, who are more than willing to do life with you. Remember that. There's someone I have a shameful moment in my life As a Christian, I stopped reading my Bible and was not uh, faithful going to church. And I fell back into the worldly ways, you know? And uh, it hurt me. It hurt me deep, you know, because you know, I fell into uh, drinking again, adultery, lying, all kinds of things. And it's like, wait, wait a minute. I know God. I have read the Bible, but all of a sudden now, what am I doing, you know? And so uh, that was very disappointing. And, you know, at the time, <clears throat> I've been walking with Christ for quite a while, several years. I was on fire with the Lord, you know? And always, I mean, I couldn't read the Bible enough. I was so drawn to reading God's Word and to doing it. Yes, I, you know, I, me and Mike, we talk about it, I think every week. If we don't fill ourselves up daily, then our flesh in the world is going to. And there's no, there's no lag time. It's, it's there. So it's, we have to make, we have to be on purpose with God. He's not going to force his hand on us. So it's, it's a choice, fellas. Feel yourself they draw energy from winning battles and proving others wrong. Because of this, they're highly sensitive to opposing views, quick to throw up walls, and often live a reactionary existence. Hmm. Jesus was not reactionary. People questioned and doubted him at every turn. But Jesus never threw his hands up, pouted, or sought revenge. He just continued to love people, never losing his focus, remaining steadfast to his mission. Jesus is our model. As we mold our life around him, we become less concerned with being right or being liked. If a person is constantly offended, it might be a warning there's something that needs to be evaluated in their personal lives. I'll say that again. If a person is constantly offended, it might be a warning there's something they need to reevaluate in their personal lives. Again, no one is perfect. But if you're not willing to place your personal problems at the foot of the cross, then it's going to be a constant and turtle battle. When a person's spirit is stirred up many times, that is the Lord trying to get your attention. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 9, it states, test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, not me. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience? that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to test and are rejected as counterfeit. But I hope you would acknowledge that we do not fail the test, nor are we to be rejected. 
But I pray to God that you may do nothing wrong, not so that we and our teaching may appear to be approved, but that you may continue doing what is right, even though we, by comparison, may seem to have failed. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth and the gospel, the good news of salvation. We are glad when we are weak, since God's power comes freely through us. But you, by comparison, are strong. We also pray for this, that you be made complete, fully restored, growing and maturing in godly character and spirit, pleasing your heavenly Father by the life you live. If you get offended, guys, it's time to reevaluate. It should not be happening that often. It should be less. Immature Christians are also unable to control their tongue. Many people's reputations have been destroyed due to gossip. Many relationships have been destroyed due to gossip. Many ministries have been destroyed due to gossip. Immature Christians like to tear people down instead of build them up. They enjoy planting seeds of death instead of seeds of life. What they fail to realize is that every idle word they've spoken, they will have to give an account for when they stand before God. In Matthew 12, 35 to 37, it states, The good man from his inner good treasure brings out good things, and the evil man from, the inner, from his inner evil treasure brings out evil things. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will have to give an accounting for every careless or useless word they speak. For by your words, reflecting your spiritual condition, you will be justified and acquitted of guilt of sin. And by your words, rejecting me, you will be condemned. My last point is, and I used to be, I used to fall into this category big time because I didn't read my Bible. And pray and meditate. Immature Christians follow men instead of God. This is piggybacking a little bit what Steve talked about last week. They seek the glory and praise of men over God. They measure success with a short term view rather than an eternal one. They measure success with a short term view rather than an eternal one. They are drawn to the type of work and serving opportunities that put them in a position to be noticed and praised by others. <clears throat> they believe a church should be about increasing numbers and not saving souls. They believe a church success is based on money, the facilities they have, and how popular it is. They refuse to hold their pastor or church leadership accountable when they go against godly principles. They believe the wealth of man determines his status in the body of Christ rather than his obedience and love for God. They believe the wealth of a man determines his, stati his status in the body of Christ rather than his obedience and love for God. I tell you this, guys. There's going to be a lot of people you think are going to heaven that are not. There's going to be a lot of people you think are not going that are. That's right. Yeah. Basically, they are carnal-minded and have the spirit of a Pharisee. They place more value in the things of this world and the opinions of men over the things of the spirit and wisdom of God. They place more value in the things of this world and in the opinion of men over the things of the spirit and the wisdom of God. In Matthew 23, 1 to, 1 to, uh, 1 to 12, it states, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their banquets, I'm sorry, they make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. Yeah. Yeah. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And you do not call in, 
Um, anyone on earth, Father, for you have one Father. He is in heaven. That's right. That's right. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So again, uh, just to recap. <laughs> Stop saying this. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, musical interlude. No background music. Major, <laughs> major signs, guys, of immaturity. Self-centered, constantly complaining, refuses to believe the Holy Spirit speaks to all believers, does not put a priority of reading their Bible and fellowshipping with other believers, is easily offended and unable to control their tongue, and puts more faith in men rather than God. My final thoughts are, the transition from milk to meat should be a natural one for most Christians. Mature Christians find themselves, I'm sorry, mature Christians should find themselves wanting to go deeper into the Word of God, pray more frequently, and value saving lost souls. They should naturally desire to teach others who are less spiritually mature rather than constantly needing to be fed. Spiritual growth only occurs when the believer is transformed by the renewing of their mind. And the renewing of the mind happens at a rate by which a person meditates on Scripture and obeys it. It all comes down to one thing. Either a person is going to submit to God's will or theirs. If a ter and I talked about this at the beginning. If a person does not fill themselves up with God's word on a daily basis, then their flesh and the world will. Like Steve said last week, if you know of anyone who's constantly struggling in these areas, it's time to port, point them back to Jesus so they can get their mind right. It is the only way a man or woman will be an effective witness in the body of Christ. Uh, some key points I have here. Number one, cursed is the one who pit, puts his or her faith in man. Cursed is the one who puts his or her faith in man. And the scripture is Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. Number two. Okay. Number one, cursed is the one who puts his or her faith in man. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. It's being recorded. Number two, the clay cannot shape the potter. Number two, the clay cannot shape the potter. Isaiah 45, 9 to 20. Isaiah 45, 9 to 20. Number three, God will use you when he can trust you. God will use you when he can trust you. 1 Kings 3, 7 to 15. 1 Kings 3, 7 to 15. And number four, blessed is the one who puts his or her faith in the Lord and meditates on his word. Blessed is the one who puts his or her faith in the Lord and meditates on his word. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. So I just want to read you guys a story here. And it's titled, The Three Trees. Once upon a time, on a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up at the stars and said, I want to hold treasure. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I'll be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be traveling mighty waters and carrying powerful kings. I'll be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below where busy men and women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave the mountaintop at all. 
I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they'll raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Years passed. The rain came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It is perfect for me. With the swoop of his axe, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest. I shall hold wonderful treasure, the first tree said. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It is perfect for me. With the swoop of his axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship for mighty kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree tall and pointed bravely, I'm sorry, any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. With a swoop of his axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought her to the carpenter's shop, but the carpenter fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold nor treasure. She was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took her to a shipyard, but no mighty sailing ship was made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. She was too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river. Instead, she was taken to a little lake. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened? The once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted was to stay on the top of the mountain and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. The, trees, the three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, golden uh, starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the bee box. I wish I could make it cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. The manger is beautiful she said, and suddenly the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon, a thundering and th uh, thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. She knew she did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through with the wind and the rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hands, and said, Peace! The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. And suddenly the second tree knew she was carrying the king of heaven and earth. Hmm. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten wood pile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when the soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the third tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. <clears throat> that was better than being the tallest tree in the world. The next time you feel down because you don't get what you want, sit tight and be happy. Huh? Because God is thinking of something better to give you. Amen. So, nice. Basically, what, I, uh, what this spoke to me, this story was, God is waiting for us to mature, guys. So he can use us bigger, better, and more than we can ever imagine. But until we mature and grow into strong trees, we 
can't be used. He has to continue to water us. How long that takes, it's up to us. But if you allow him to water you, you will be used like these trees were. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you. For all three trees. Those first two trees. I was worried about the first two trees. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I really was. <laughs> so, yep. You know, guys, uh, a while back, you know, we had a little bit about the.